It's fair to say that William Lassell was a very lucky man. Born on the right side of 19th century England's pitiless wealth divide, in his mid-twenties he attained his fortune the old-fashioned way, by marrying a rich widow. His family had been clock and watchmakers, but he decided to follow his dowry and enter his wife's late husband's business of brewing. In 1825, at the age of just 26, Lassell founded his own brewery and, since the production of legal recreational drugs is an eternally lucrative profession, he found that he could leave it to more experienced underlings and become a gentleman of leisure. But unlike many who drift upward into the indolent classes, for Lassell, Easy Street was a blank canvas on which he would paint his legacy. What Lassell intended his legacy to be can be gleaned from the name he gave his house, Starfield. As befits a scion of clockmakers, Lassell possessed a natural mechanical ingenuity and dexterity, and by the age of 21 had already constructed his own 9-inch aperture reflecting telescope. In 1844, with the help of James Naismith, the inventor of the steam hammer, Lassell constructed a reflecting telescope with an aperture of 24 inches and a focal length of 20 feet. It was the first telescope of its size to be constructed with an equatorial mount, which allowed its position to be subtly moved in line with the Earth's rotation keeping the target in sight. According to the account of Edward S. Holden, director of the Lick Observatory in California, who was an acquaintance of Lassell in his early years, the Reverend William Dawes, Lassell's friend and fellow astronomer, had sent him an urgent letter requesting that he join the hunt for the eighth planet, which England was in danger of losing to the French. Unfortunately, Lassell was laid up with a sprained ankle and, due to the carelessness of a maid, never saw the letter until it was too late and so the French would ultimately locate and name the planet Neptune. This story is based on hearsay and widely regarded as apocryphal, but I find it too cute to exclude. In the aftermath of Neptune's discovery, John Herschel, head of the Royal Astronomical Society and son of William Herschel, who discovered Uranus, wrote feverishly to Lassell that he and his remarkable telescope, quote, find satellites with all possible expedition, exclamation point. England may have lost Neptune, but it could still raise its flag on Neptune's moon. It says something about Lassell's standing, that the head of the Royal Astronomical Society entrusted the job of finding Neptune's moon to a complete amateur whose only qualification was that he was rich enough to have his own telescope. The trust, however, was well placed. On the 10th of October, 1846, just 17 days after the discovery of its parent planet, Lassell announced that he had found Neptune's moon, today named Triton, after the son of Poseidon, the Greek Neptune. In an ironic final twist to this tale of national cosmic rivalry, the name was chosen by a Frenchman, Camille Le Marion. The following year, Lassell suspected he may have observed two ghostly points around the planet Uranus, but it wasn't until 1851, after Lassell had done the obvious and relocated his observatory to Malta from the astronomically inhospitable climes of northern England that he was able to confirm them. But even after his discovery was confirmed, Lassell found himself the subject of not a little scorn. William Herschel, who discovered Uranus's two largest moons as well as the planet itself, claimed in a later paper to have found another two and possibly another four moons, leading many to conclude that Lassell had merely followed up on Herschel's discoveries. However, Lassell, after observing Uranus at more than a thousand times magnification, found no other moons and concluded, in a letter to the Reverend John Sheepshanks of the Royal Astronomical Society, that, quote, I think it's high time that Uranus's establishment should be reduced. He has been luxuriating these many years with a retinue that I really believe does not belong to him, and therefore he must be cut down to four attendants until some astronomer arises rich enough to present him with some more. Posterity agrees with him. Lassell is now considered the sole discoverer of the two moons. With four moons now to deal with, John Herschel decided they needed names, and in another act of poetic nationalism, rather than going the traditional route of Greek mythology, decided to draw on English literature for inspiration. Each of the four moons was given the name of a fairy from a pen of an English writer. Titania and Oberon from Shakespeare, Umbriel from Alexander Pope, and Ariel from both. It's actually unclear if it was Herschel or Lassell who named some or all of the moons, but Herschel is usually given full credit.
The outermost planets of our solar system do not give up their secrets easily, even now, and it would be nearly 100 years before Lassell's promised successor arose. Contrary to Lassell's prediction, though, Gerard Peter Kuiper was not particularly rich. In fact, he owed his academic career mostly to hard graft, exceptional visual acuity, and shrugging off the snobbery of his wealthier classmates. By the time he left his native Holland and settled in the US, Kuiper had become the most important planetary astronomer of the 20th century. In fact, I have made extensive reference to his achievements in previous videos, and will very likely make a biography of him someday. As such, I do not intend to dwell on his story here. Suffice to say that in 1948, at the University of Texas's McDonald Observatory, Kuiper fought past the glare of Uranus to glimpse a tiny, dim inner moon, smaller and closer by far than any of his siblings. In the preceding decades, the fairy rationale for naming Uranus's moons had been forgotten, and Kuiper chose to name his petite moon Miranda, after a human character from Shakespeare's The Tempest, an unwitting precedent that would unleash a flood once Voyager 2 arrived. Only a year later, Kuiper also discovered the second known moon of Neptune, Nereid, which would remain Triton's sole known sibling until the arrival of Voyager 2 in 1989. Just to give you an idea of what a phenomenal astronomer Gerard Kuiper was, Nereid is a broken piece of space junk about 170 kilometers across that orbits its planet in slightly less than one Earth year. Kuiper was able to observe that object and its movement from over 4 billion kilometers away. For much of the Space Age's golden era, the satellites of Uranus and Neptune remained tantalizingly inscrutable. For 40 years, astronomers strained against the distance to glean whatever facts they could about their diameters, masses, or compositions, and patiently waited for Voyager 2, to date our only mission to the two outermost planets, to prove them all spectacularly wrong. The one thing nearly everyone could agree about the moons of the outer planets was that Triton was blindingly bright, while the moons of Uranus were tenebrously dark. The only question was to what degree. When, in 1986, Voyager 2 finally rendezvoused with Uranus, the scientists could say that, in that regard at least, their predictions were confirmed. The moons of Uranus are even darker than they had thought. Even the brightest of the moons, Miranda, is barely brighter than our own planet, while the darkest, Umbriel, is almost as dark as Mercury, the darkest planet in the solar system. They appear as blackened, shadowed tomb worlds, riven with ancient fractures and crossed by rolling coal-black plains. They were also tiny. While astronomers had determined their diameters and masses fairly accurately by the time of Voyager's arrival, all the major moons proved substantially smaller and less massive in the flesh than they had on paper. And this was strange, because once we learnt the moon's densities, they suggested that, unlike the moons of Saturn, which were worlds of water orbiting a desiccated ball of gas, the moons of the solar system's first water world appeared to comprise an even mixture of ice and what astronomers call rock, that is, dense, non-volatile materials. This composition is strikingly similar to another alien visitor from the dark depths of space that was scheduled to return later that same year, Comet Halley. In fact, Halley and the Uranian moons may owe their blackened, tortured appearances to a similar cause. Before being yanked into the inner solar system by Neptune, Halley was likely a bright, icy object, much as astronomers find daily in the region beyond the farthest planet. But as Halley sped round and round the inner solar system, every pass by the sun exposed it to its radiation and magnetic field, which gradually stripped the comet of its icy material, leaving mostly dry, carbonaceous dust. Similarly, the moons of Uranus all lie within Uranus's magnetosphere, whose charged particles bombard the airless worlds and gradually strip off their lighter elements, in particular hydrogen, which, some argue, was originally present as methane ice in the moon's surfaces, but is present now only as bare solid carbon, possibly graphite. This model is complicated by the fact that no methane has yet been observed on any of Uranus's moons, even though it has been observed on Triton and Pluto. A similar process is believed to have created the carbon dioxide present in the surface of the moon, since that compound would not survive on the surface for very long, 
with oxygen in the water combining with carbon on the surface. The moons of Uranus are all roughly the same color. And no, those images are not black and white. That's what they look like. And crisscrossed with sinuous, steep-sided canyons, appropriately called Graben after the German word for grave. Graben form when land splits apart, or faults, causing either the sides to rise or the center to subside. In the case of Uranus's moons, this faulting is believed to be due to a weird property of water that I discussed in my video on Titan. As it freezes, water expands, and if water freezes below an already frozen surface, it pushes upward, creating those blistering cracks so horribly familiar to ice skaters. This means that the moon's interiors must at some point have been liquid, and it isn't the only evidence. All the larger moons of Uranus show signs of tectonic activity, usually of vast lava flows obliterating earlier evidence of impacts. These lava flows are believed to have been created not by liquid rock, but by a viscous, lava-like water ammonia mixture. Precisely how such tiny moons could have retained inner heat long enough to produce these tectonic features is not clear. They certainly are not visible on Saturn's mid-range moons, such as Rhea, Dione, or Iapetus, all of which are of comparable mass and similar composition. Perhaps the Uranian's rockier interiors allowed for radioactive decay to continue for a longer time. More likely, though, tectonic activity was driven by early changes in their orbits which saw them fall into temporary resonances with one another, as Europa and Enceladus are today. But no matter how extensive their tectonic activity may have once been, it is gone now. All of Uranus's moons show evidence of ancient cratering, not unlike our own moon's primordial highland, which means that, again, much like our own moon, any volcanic activity they may have once demonstrated was over billions of years ago. Today, the moons of Uranus are very much dead. As it turns out, the lugubrious appearances of the satellites of Uranus are even more apropos than that, as current consensus among astronomers is that the moons are scars from an ancient wound. Uranus, as I explained in the previous video in this series, orbits the sun on its side, with its moons and rings circling it like the hands of a clock. The most likely culprit is a massive collision that thwacked Uranus in the chaotic era of the solar system's formation. This collision is believed to have ejected a massive amount of material into orbit, which eventually coalesced into the moons. A similar impact is believed to have formed our own moon. Arguably the most striking feature of the largest moons of Uranus is their similarity to one another. Few of the moons demonstrate the individuality seen in the moons of Jupiter or Saturn. Of course, this may be simply due to a lack of data, since all we have of their surfaces are their southern hemispheres. And in fact, not even that, since they were only half illuminated by the sun. Oberon has a distinctive pimple on its left side that may be the central peak of an impact crater. If so, it would be the largest in the Uranian system. The mostly drab moon Umbriel has a bright white feature at its top side called Wanda that gives it the appearance of a cherry bomb. It is believed to be cryovolcanic in origin, possibly an eruption triggered by a meteorite strike. The white spot in the corner called Vuver, may be a frozen tip of a cryovolcano. For all the moon's seeming drabness and sameness, there was one spectacular, staggering exception. An exception so bizarre and inexplicable that the poor scientists at NASA, who had little more than 24 hours to come to terms with it before revealing it to the press, were left speechless. Even before Voyager's encounter, it was clear that Miranda was different from her siblings being both substantially smaller and less dense. In fact, Miranda is one of the smallest objects in the solar system known to still be spherical under its own gravity. Its low relative density meant that, unlike its rockier neighbors, it followed the satellites of Saturn in being mostly made of ice. Its size and bulk composition are similar to that of Saturn's tiny moon Mimas, which led the NASA team to assume that it would be similar in appearance as well a squashed, icy ball riddled with craters. They were wrong. For all the universe, Miranda resembled an ancient alien spacecraft summoned from the pages of the Necronomicon, with strange geometrical cysts erupting from its ancient craters and a cleft in its side so deep it was as if some cosmic monster had torn at it with its teeth. By the way, that bite, Verona Rupus, 
is the highest vertical drop in the solar system, 20 kilometers straight down. In Miranda's low gravity, if you jumped off the top, it would take you 12 minutes to hit the surface. If Miranda were scaled to the size of the Earth, Verona would be 320 kilometers, or 200 miles, deep, and stretch halfway across the continental United States. And yet, for all that, it is probably the least studied feature on Miranda. I had to personally contact a planetary scientist for information about it, and he graciously informed me that pretty much no one had studied it. Guess it wasn't awesome enough for them. If I had to hazard a guess as to how it formed, Verona seems tied to a series of ice fracture graben that follow Miranda's 340 degree line of longitude, called, appropriately enough, the 340 degree chasma. Perhaps Verona is a mega version of the same faulting process that overtook all the major moons of Uranus. But again, that's just a guess. The main focus of scientists' attention on Miranda has been the three weirdly geometrical features, called coronae, the pockmark its surface. The first, and least distinguishable, on the left side, is called Elsinore. The middle corona, which touches the South Pole, is called Inverness, and the far corona, on the right side, is called Arden. In their initial attempts to make sense of these structures' monumental oddness, astronomers and planetary scientists went full apocalyptic. Miranda had been hit by a giant planetary body that had literally torn it apart. Its fragments then recoalesced into a random, chaotic jumble, with bits of heavier core falling downward from the surface. As the fragments fell, the crust contracted, and the coronae were the scars left behind. Superficially, this idea is compelling. Miranda's orbit around Uranus is highly inclined or tilted from Uranus's equator, by as much as ten or even a hundred times the other large moons. Something must have happened in its path to jack its orbit so markedly. But over time, that melodramatic explanation fell from favor, as it simply did not fit the facts. The coronae of Miranda are surrounded by concentric rings of faults and scarps, if the catastrophic impact hypothesis is correct, those scarps should reveal signs of compression. Instead, they show signs of having been pulled apart. This is consistent with the hypothesis that the coronae formed not from a falling impact, but from a rising plume from within Miranda itself. Today, most scientists in the field support the idea that the coronae formed through a process called diaperism, which, while it sounds like the state of being a blood-sucking baby, is in fact the extrusion of a solid mass through a brittle or more malleable rock. In essence, the coronae are rubber ducts held underwater and then let go. At some point in its past, when its orbit was far more eccentric than today, Miranda would have entered into a 3 to 1 resonance with Umbria, which, like the resonances that power the volcanism on Io and Enceladus, would have heated its interior. Pure water has too high a melting point for it to have been the mechanism alone, though it may have been a mixture of water and ammonia, or simply solid ice that was hot enough to convect heat, much like Earth's mantle today. This resonance would have jacked Miranda's orbit to its current inclination. The heating of the interior created what were essentially magma plumes within Miranda, analogous to the hot spots on Earth that form the Hawaiian Islands. The upwelling produced the banded terrain seen on the coronae, particularly Inverness, similar to the effects seen in similar diapers on Earth, such as salt domes. Even given the solutions presented here, they are still merely educated guesses. Miranda, its tortured surface, and its fellow moons are likely to remain a mystery until such time as we see fit to send an orbiter to Uranus. As no such orbiter is likely in the foreseeable future, it is a mystery our children will likely not see solved. While Uranus has its own retinue of fascinating oddball satellites, Neptune essentially has one. Yes, there are other Neptunian moons, 13 in fact, but all of them together comprise just one-third of one percent of the mass in orbit around Neptune. For all intents and purposes, to speak of the moons of Neptune is to speak solely of Triton. Don't worry, those smaller moons, as well as the smaller moons of Uranus, will have their day in the next episode when I discuss the planet's rings. Before Voyager 2's arrival on Neptune, 
Astronomers could say only three things definitively about its moon, Triton. First, that it was bright. Really bright. But precisely why it was so bright was still not settled. Objects appear bright through a telescope for three reasons. First, because, well, they're bright. Second, because they're close. And finally, because they're big. Everyone knew where Triton was, so the second option was out. It was possible that Triton could simply have been inherently bright, as bright as, say, fresh snow. But a far more intoxicating idea, and the one that took hold of astronomers' imaginations, was that it was big. Early estimates for its diameter were as high as 6,000 kilometers, which would have made it the largest moon in the solar system, and almost as big as Mars. The second thing everyone knew, or at least was moderately certain of, was that Triton had an atmosphere. In 1977, Dale Cruikshank, an astronomer at the University of Hawaii, found strong spectrographic traces of methane and molecular nitrogen on Triton, which suggested, given Triton's surface temperature, that they might be present as gas. The strength of the bands also suggested the presence of, of all things, liquid nitrogen on its surface, which set Cruikshank's mind alight with visions of nitrogen oceans dotted with methane icebergs. In 1987, in the lead-up to Voyager's encounter, astronomers M. L. Dolitsky and W. R. Thompson lyrically pondered that they might glimpse, quote, the glint of a distant sun reflected off a calm nitrogen sea. The final thing that everyone knew and in many ways strangest of all, was the Triton, giant, glimmering Triton, was a captured object. That is, rather than forming with its planet, as all of the large satellites are supposed to have done, Triton was a separately orbiting body that somehow got ensnared by Neptune's gravity and set into orbit around it. This was insane. Objects as big as Triton do not get captured. The next largest captured object in the solar system is Saturn's moon Phoebe, a former comet 3,000 times smaller than Triton. The reason Triton is almost certainly captured is because its orbit is retrograde. In other words, it orbits Neptune in the opposite direction to the planet's rotation. Moons that form with their planets, just like planets that form with their stars, orbit in the same direction that their planets, or stars, rotate. Beyond this, Voyager also identified carbon monoxide ice on Triton's surface. Models suggest that carbon monoxide would not survive in the swirling proto-satellite nebula around a giant planet. That Triton is captured also goes some way toward explaining why Neptune's other moons are a scattered mess of pulverized rubble. As so often happens in solar system exploration, reality dashed the hopes of the Romantics while at the same time revealing truths no one had predicted. Triton, sadly, was not 6,000 kilometers across, but 2,700, which still made it larger than the then still planet Pluto. Triton is, in fact, rather bright, with an albedo averaging 0.76, about the same as day-old snow, which is appropriate because its surface is largely composed of frozen nitrogen with a little water ice mixed in. This brightness actually makes Triton the coldest place ever to have its temperature directly measured, at just 33 degrees above absolute zero. Even Pluto, which is usually farther from the Sun than Triton, is warmer than that, because its darker surface retains more heat. As for the atmosphere, well, it turned out that the predictions had been right. Like Titan's, and ours, Triton's atmosphere is composed mainly of nitrogen. Unlike Titan, in this case, the pessimists were also right. Triton's atmosphere has a surface pressure of only 14 microbars, about 1 70,000th the surface pressure on Earth. Though it was still a billion times thicker than our own moon's pathetic atmosphere, and substantial enough to support wind and clouds of nitrogen ice particles. Like Titan's atmosphere, or indeed that of its own adopted planet, Triton's even managed to gain a hydrocarbon haze through photolysis of methane. Sadly, no liquid nitrogen seas were observed, but steaming nitrogen geysers were. And while Voyager couldn't provide an explanation for Triton's capture, events over the next few years would offer a stark change of perspective on that. In the years leading up to the Voyager encounter, it was noted that Triton was becoming gradually less red. Voyager would reveal the reason why. Like Uranus and its moons, Triton orbits the sun on its side, meaning that the moon's 42-year-long seasons were extreme. The South Pole, which was the only pole Voyager could see, 
the other was still trapped in decades-long darkness, was capped by a sheet of methane and nitrogen stained red with carbon-rich tholins created by reactions of methane ice with sunlight. This cap was gigantic, extending down to 35 degrees latitude. On Earth, it would touch Oklahoma City, or Tokyo. And it was still evaporating, meaning that it had once been much larger. Even before Voyager, it was speculated that Triton's atmosphere could freeze into solid nitrogen at the poles, much as Mars's carbon dioxide atmosphere freezes at the poles during its far shorter winter. It seemed likely that, as the nitrogen evaporated from the cap, it traveled from the sunlit pole to the darker, colder equator. Remember, Triton is sideways and froze again, leaving a bright patina on the surface that obscured the darker material underneath. This would mean that atmospheric density would vary greatly with season. In 2010, when Triton's southern hemisphere passed from spring into its long, long summer, astronomers at the European Southern Observatory noticed its atmosphere noticeably thicken as nitrogen evaporated from its surface. Since Voyager, a noticeable reddening of Triton's surface has occurred, likely due to cryovolcanic deposition of dark material which has led to a decrease in Triton's albedo and a subsequent rise in temperature. The most spectacular finding of the Voyager probe, however, was that Triton was a member of a highly exclusive club of worlds in the solar system, those known beyond any doubt to be geologically active. The only others to date are Io, Enceladus, and of course, Earth, though that will almost certainly change in future. Triton's surface is remarkably smooth. Down to the limits of its camera's resolution, Voyager found very few impact craters. This meant that Triton's surface had to be strikingly young, millions of years instead of billions, and thus it must have been resurfaced relatively recently. Almost all of the features on Triton's surface were endogenic. That is, the result of processes emerging from within Triton itself, either volcanic, such as icy lava flows, or tectonic, such as the sinuous fracture ridges of the kind seen on Europa and on Uranus's satellites. All this suggested that Triton's interior was molten until very recently, and likely remains so today. Voyager found the observed region of Triton's surface to be 55% nitrogen ice and 45% a mixture of water and carbon dioxide ice, with the volatile nitrogen forming an upper cap and the water slash carbon dioxide forming the involatile bedrock. Although water ice was not initially detected, it was later in subsequent spectrographic studies, it was the only substance strong enough to support what few mountains were seen on the surface, and so was deemed to be the moon's main construction material. The inherent weakness of water as opposed to rock meant that there was very little variation in the terrain, barely a few hundred meters between the lowest and the highest elevation. Many smooth plains show evidence of having been filled in by watery lava flows, most likely the same water-ammonia mixture hypothesized for the satellites of Uranus, and even the calderas from which they erupted. Much of Triton was composed of so-called cantaloupe terrain, a field of roughly equal-sized depression that had no analog anywhere in the solar system. The current favorite hypothesis for their existence is, yes, diaperism. The higher rims are believed to be solid lumps that have floated to the surface. But this was only the start. The Voyager team had initially been perplexed by a series of northwestward trending dark streaks dotted around Triton's south pole. Clearly, they were being driven by the prevailing wind. But what could they be? Perhaps dust devils, like those seen on Earth or Mars? And then, Voyager caught one of the most significant shots of its tour. A plume of cloudy material rising from the ground. An eruption. Triton was volcanically active. But with what? The Voyager team noticed that all the observed eruptions were occurring near the subsolar point or the point at which the sun shines brightest on Triton's surface. This suggested that what was occurring was related, somehow, to sunlight. The preferred model today is that these eruptions are not technically volcanoes, but geysers. Solid nitrogen is translucent, and as the sun passes through it, creates a more literal version of the greenhouse effect, heating the material below until it vaporizes, gradually building pressure until the surface cracks, releasing it as an explosion of dirty nitrogen smoke, which then travels eight kilometers into the atmosphere, whereupon it is capped by a thermal inversion and spread eastward. It seemed like something out of a fantasy. A vibrant, living world of volcanoes, geysers, clouds, and winds that somehow found itself adrift in space and swept up into another world's embrace? How could this have happened? 
There had always been a problem with the notion of Triton's capture. Something would have had to intervene to slow Triton down enough for Neptune to catch it. The chances of this happening at random, let alone in a space as huge as the region near Neptune, are infinitesimal. So whatever that something was would have had to have been tied somehow to either Neptune or Triton. One thing that had become clear in the decade prior to Voyager was the Triton was strikingly similar in both size and composition to the planet, quote-unquote, Pluto. Voyager would only strengthen this connection. As well as being nearly the same size and density, both worlds had surfaces covered in a combination of nitrogen ice and red-stained tholin, though Pluto is far redder than Triton, and thin nitrogen-based atmospheres. For a short time, the hypothesis circulated either that Pluto was a former moon of Neptune that had had its orbit disrupted by the coming of Triton, or that both Triton and Pluto were moons of Neptune that had had their orbits disrupted by a larger body. Except that Pluto, as I noted in an earlier video, never actually comes anywhere near Neptune in its orbit. So what could have happened? In 1992, the answer finally revealed itself. Pluto was just one of hundreds of thousands of similar objects in its region of space, now called the Kuiper Belt. Triton was once another Kuiper Belt object like Pluto, and, like Pluto, probably existed as part of a binary. In the early years of the solar system, Neptune is believed to have been kicked into the early Kuiper Belt by the gravity of Saturn, and, in the process, likely collided with this hapless couple. Triton's sad suitor was sent spiraling alone into the void, but not before slowing her betrothed enough to send him into the arms of the home-wrecking Neptune. But, like all torrid relationships, that between Neptune and Triton is destined to end badly. Triton's orbit around Neptune is slowly decaying, and in 3.5 billion years or so, it will pass inside Neptune's Roche limit. Once that happens, Triton will be torn apart, granting Neptune a vast set of pretty new rings. Over time, these rings too will fade, as Neptune slowly consumes them. Thanks again, fellow seekers, for following me through this exploration of the little-known satellites of the outermost planets. Please join me next time, when I will be exploring the rings of Uranus and Neptune. And as always, please like, comment, subscribe, and follow me on social media. I have links in the description. See you soon!